Angie Halverson, and I will serve as your moderator for today's presentation. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join us today. We are going to be recording this call, um, and the information that you see in this presentation will be posted to SAMHSA's YouTube page. Uh, in our next e-blast out to the field uh, regarding the next webinar in this series, we will give you the link to that YouTube posting if it is available on the YouTube site at that time. I would like to let everyone know that all lines are muted, and we would ask that you submit all of your comments via the chat function uh, on your GoToWebinar uh, screen. We will conclude our session today with a Q&A session, so please go ahead and feel free to post your questions in that chat function. We will take a look at those, and we will talk to our presenter uh, and present those questions to him at the end. Next slide, please. Again, welcome to the Care Coordination for OTP series. This is the first of SAMHSA's new five-part series to be held monthly through the month of August. Again, all of our sessions will be record recorded and posted to the SAMHSA YouTube page. Our next session will be held May 10, 2018 from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and we will be discussing case studies from the field, applications of care management. Uh, please join us for that presentation. We will have uh, individuals who have actually applied and implemented uh, OTP care coordination uh, who will be coming to talk to us about how to do that, some of the challenges that they have experienced and ways to overcome those. We will send out the registration link uh, via our Health IT Webinars listserv, uh, and it will also come through the SAMHSA eBlast about two weeks in advance. If you would like to be added to that email list, please submit your request to the, web, the email address on the screen in front of you, and we will add your name to the list for those upcoming webinars. We will also release the upcoming series dates and topics uh, in the next couple of weeks. At this time, uh, I'd like to let you know our agenda will be welcoming remarks from Dr. Anthony Campbell of SAMHSA. We will follow that up with our keynote presenter, Dr. Kenneth Stoller, uh, who will talk about care coordination and give you a very high-level overview of care coordination uh, and OTPs. And then we will follow that up with an open discussion with Dr. Stoller. Again, please submit your questions and comments via the chat box at any time during the presentation. And now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Anthony Campbell, Commander in the United States Public Health Service. He is a clinical specialty consultant for SAMHSA uh, and also uh, at the Division of Pharmacologic Therapies. Dr. Campbell, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to turn it over to you at this time. Well, thank you, Angie, for that uh, brief uh, and uh, nicely overview. Uh, SAMHSA, basically, we, we like to welcome all of you viewers uh, who are and participants of this webinar today. We are very excited about this new series, um, and, and as it, it falls in lines with SAMHSA's new initiatives. Today, um, we're excited to have uh, Dr. Kenneth Stoller, who will be presenting part one of a part uh, of a five-part webinar series um, uh, regarding coordination of care in OTPs. Um, today's webinar is entitled Care Coordination 101. Uh, again, Dr. Kenneth Stoller, we're very um, happy to have him. Uh, Dr. Stoller basically is an assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. And he is also the director of, of John Hopkins Broadway Center for Addiction. Um, today, he will be discussing uh, how OTPs can serve as vital hubs or centers of expertise and in integration uh, to create seamless symptoms, systems, I'm sorry, of care by working with primary uh, special uh, medical specialties as well as mental health providers uh, and actually uh, promoting the integration of care and expertise in our open treatment programs. He will also be kind of going over briefly about the role of social services, criminal justice system, as well as other government entities. Uh, again, SAMHSA recognizes the potential for uh, care coordination to improve the quality of care for patients uh, who receive um, substance abuse treatment uh, across the entire spectrum uh, of care. And that spectrum of care includes prevention, treatment, as well as recovery. Uh, 
So I hope you find uh, value in today's webinar and that uh, you will be able to attend the remaining webinars that we have scheduled in this exciting series. Um, having said that, I will now turn the microphone over to our presenter today, Dr. Kenneth Stoller. Thank Thanks so much, Tony. And it's really, really a pleasure to be here this morning slash afternoon. So I don't have any relevant disclosures today. And uh, just as a, just a bit more background in terms of my being director of the Johns Hopkins Broadway Center for Addiction, just to clarify, that's the uh, outpatient substance use disorder treatment program for the Johns Hopkins Hospital. So it just gives a little bit of context to my um, to my day-to-day -day activities as the director of an outpatient addiction treatment program that does have an OTP component to it. So I, I understand that the audience today is rather broad. So we will be starting with um, you know, a few slides on the opioid crisis. Um, these are almost those obligatory scary slides that you see for all these talks. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, despite that, I'd just like to remind everybody just to keep in mind that each of these fatalities, which are just so easy to breeze over in terms of a number or a graph, you know, represent a a mother or father or a sibling or child, a friend or colleague, and I'm, I'm sure that every single person that called in here has in some way been personally touched by this crisis. Um, we'll then talk about the different medications for addiction treatment and specifically for opioid use disorder. We'll talk some um, in more theoretical way about the uh, integration and integrated and coordinated care. And then what we'll do is review a uh, OTP-centric coordinated care model um, and spending some time on a particular model that I use sort of in the spirit of you know, how these case studies will be used for the rest of this series. I'd like to use the particular model that I use as sort of a program-wide case study, um, just as one example of how care coordination can be done. And then finally, we'll end with a discussion of the benefits of doing this sort of work and some of the barriers that one might <clears throat> encounter along the way. So this slide shows the alarming rate of drug overdoses in the United States from 1999 to 2016. This is uh, all drug deaths, and so it, it is uh, 64,000 deaths per year um, in 2016, and if you do the math, that calculates out to 175 deaths per day, and just during this talk, five people will die from drug overdoses. Across the nation, this is obviously a, a problem. No state is immune, uh, but there are some variations between the states, and you can see how they cluster in different regions and areas. Um, but, you know, what's consistent across states is the gradual increase over the years in drug overdoses. This slide breaks it down in terms of what drugs were involved in fatal overdoses. And so what I did was uh, to box in, in the red boxes, the opioids. And you can see that over half of overdose deaths um, in the United States uh, have been recently due to opioids. The, uh, the really remarkable curve here is the one that shows up in light blue. That's synthetic opioids other than methadone. And so this is primarily fentanyl and analogs of fentanyl that have um, been increasing in um, showing up, increasingly showing up in the drug supply in the United States. In fact, uh, you know, for the first time recently in our own programs, uh, urinalysis results, um, fentanyl positive urines uh, overtook general opioids. So how did we get here? Well, you know, this is a whole another hour long talk, but um, you know, the important thing to understand is that the increase, these gradual increase in opioid deaths and uh, therefore opioid treatment admissions have really paralleled the uh, increase 
in opioid medication sales and, and therefore prescribing. So the uh, increasing prescribing of, um, of opioids uh, for typically for pain and chronic pain, um, especially longer acting opioids, uh, has been associated with an increase in deaths. And in fact, uh, if uh, I were to ask my patients coming in, you know, what percentage of you started with oral opioids as opposed to starting with heroin, uh, you know, across the United States at this point, um, the, the good majority of people are actually starting with oral opioids as opposed to heroin. So we'll review some of the, the, the uh, all three actually of the medications that are available for opioid use disorder. Um, you know, there's actually over a hundred medications that are available for hypertension. I actually counted them uh, by hand as I looked it up online because I was just curious. There's you know there's so much controversy about well, what medication is right. We have you know this medication versus that medication. Well, we only have three medications. And so it's really important that all three of these medications are available, are reimbursed for through uh, payers, and are, um, are used at clinically appropriate times. We'll be talking today mostly about buprenorphine because the nature of the, the model that I'm talking about and um, the, uh, the specific coordination model, um, but all three of these medications ideally would be available in uh, various settings. So we'll start with methadone, which does have more limitations in terms specifically of setting where it's available. Well, methadone is a full opioid agonist, and by that I mean that methadone is, uh, is a complete activator of the opioid receptor. And uh, it's taken orally, it's typically liquid, but not always when used for opioid use disorder. It's been very well studied and used for about 50 years now, uh, you know, ever since the 1960s when Dolan Neiswinder started using it, uh, started studied and then started its use. Um, in fact, I've been told by a number of people that it's actually the most studied medication in the whole field of medicine, interestingly enough. It, uh, it works in a number of ways at rather low doses, it prevents withdrawal. So you could use this medication as a way to withdraw people. Um, we actually used to have a residential program attached to our opioid treatment program, and um, this was before buprenorphine was commercially available. And we used methadone to detoxify people who were not um, converted over to methadone maintenance. We started with a dose about 30 milligrams. We might bump up to 35 or 40 for very severe withdrawal, and then we we decreased that dose by five milligrams per day to zero dose. And people did rather well, so even despite those lower doses. Um, but um, methadone also can reduce craving, and to get that effect, the dose needs to be a bit higher. So probably around, and this is all ballpark because each person is different, but by around 60 milligrams, people will notice that their cravings start to get lower. And, uh, and the third way that methadone works is by blocking the, the high that people get from opioids, uh, for example, from heroin. So if they were to slip and they're at an adequate blocking dose of methadone, then they, they wouldn't feel or wouldn't feel as intensely that um, agonist or high effect from that heroin or another opioid that they're using. And that dose typically uh, would be toward the 80 to 100 milligrams. Important thing to know is that, that methadone can only be dispensed through opioid treatment programs when used for the indication of opioid use disorder. And currently, there's almost 1,600 uh, OTPs in the United States. So in addition to being highly studied, um, methadone is highly regulated as well. And I believe also the the highest, the most regulated medication in all of medicine. The regulations are highly specific and highly detailed. Um, federal regulations uh, exist through SAMHSA as well as the DEA. And in addition, on top of those, states and local and localities uh, can have additional regulations. Additionally, uh, the uh, accreditation by an approved accreditation body is required as part of those 
AMSA regulations, and most commonly that means regulation or accreditation through the Joint Commission or CARF. There's a number of other um, accreditation bodies that can do that as well. And medication cannot be prescribed for opioid use disorder, meaning that you know a physician cannot write a prescription for methadone and have it filled in a pharmacy if the purpose of that prescription is to treat opioid use disorder. Methadone can be used to treat pain. Um, there's some issues, safety issues, where that may get discouraged in terms of it being used specifically for pain. Um, and in fact, the number of methadone overdoses that had been increasing over the years is um, primarily due to an increase until recently in the use of medication for the treatment of pain, not for the treatment of opioid use disorder. Um, an interesting thing about the fact that it can't be prescribed is that sometimes our patients on methadone are admitted to the hospital for various medical reasons. And at the time of discharge, if it's, let's say it's somebody who was you know, treated for a severely fractured hip and they're going to be discharged straight home and they, they'll be bedridden for some period of time, uh, the, the discharging physicians in the hospital cannot write a prescription for methadone if it's for the use in opioid use disorder um, in order to allow the person to heal for one or two weeks before they can come back to the opioid treatment program. What this means is that there needs to be good coordination of care between the hospital and the opioid treatment program. So that's just one example of, um, of why care coordination with opioid treatment programs can be so important. That's, that's one that's sort of a mandatory coordination. Um, in, in that case, by the way, what, what, what we usually like to do is to have the person, as they're being driven home, swing by our program and pick up some medically related take-homes. So there are a number of mandated services that uh, are required within opioid treatment programs. Um, first of all, dosing is supervised, and so it is actually um, dis dispensing at the medication dispensary. These services make the OTP, and really regardless of what medication is used, an ideal hub for care coordination, because people are coming frequently and the staff really tend to get to know the patients. Counseling is also required. Every patient has a specific um, treatment plan, and the goals in that treatment plan, which are supposed to be comprehensive, are followed over time to help the person improve their functioning. Drug testing is also required, um, a minimum through federal law of eight times per year. In Maryland, there's a requirement for monthly urinalysis and, um, and alcohol uh, screening. Um, in our program, we increase drug testing as people are um, struggling a bit in terms of their symptoms of, of care. So if they come up positive for a drug screen, then we're going to increase their testing to once per week. And in addition, other rehabilitative goals are supposed to be addressed, not necessarily 100% taken care of within the walls of the opioid treatment program, but these are things that the OTP really is supposed to be attending to. So issues regarding housing, um, financial stability, mental and somatic health, we'll be talking a lot about that. Vocational issues, um, addressing spirituality, family and social connections, and recreational activities. We'll move on now to the second medication for opioid use disorder, which is buprenorphine. Um, buprenorphine comes in sublingual uh, formulations as well as a formulation that sticks to the inside of the cheek. Also a six month skin implant and a once per month subcutaneous injection. Now, buprenorphine is a partial opioid agonist. So recall that a methadone was a full opioid agonist. So it, it's, methadone fully activates the opioid receptor. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist, which um, in, imparts this interesting property to it, such that if somebody takes increasing doses of buprenorphine, um, at, at some point, the agonist effects level out. And the, the one effect that you need to really worry about with opioids is respiratory depression. So if I was to give somebody you know, um, a very high dose of methadone who wasn't used to it, then their breathing would get very shallow and eventually stop and, and the person could die. With buprenorphine, there's a ceiling effect to that, and that makes it safer. And for that reason, there's been a law that's been enacted that allows physicians to actually prescribe this medication in an office-based setting and to 
for the patient to get it filled in a pharmacy. The, um, the medications actually typically combine with naloxone. The reason for this is to, to discourage diversion and misuse of the, of the medication. And just very briefly, the, uh, what, how that works is that naloxone is not absorbed um, through the mouth, under the tongue, or um, from the inside of the cheek. But if used in a way that it was unintended to be used, such as uh, by intravenous use or intranasal use, the naloxone actually is absorbed into the body, and the naloxone causes opioid withdrawal in somebody who has a tolerance to opioids. <clears throat> um, as I said, this medication can be prescribed through a doctor's office, um, but they do need to be wavered. They need uh, very specific training. Um, I think I do cover that in another slide. Um, and the, um, the, there's currently 44,000 physicians who are prescribing nationally at this point. Um, it really mainstreams treatment and expands treatment so that in areas where opioid treatment programs, OTPs, are not available, um, that, uh, or if OTPs aren't covered under the person's insurance, then this is a medication that can be used in, in those areas and also mainstreams it in terms of the patients just being able to come into a physician's office, getting a prescription just like any other medication, and then being able to, uh, to, to leave. Um, does not usually mandate counseling. There is a mandate for counseling to be, uh, referral to counseling to be possible but there's no mandate that, that counseling actually be delivered. And in fact, no mandate that the, the uh, provider must refer particular people to counseling. So it, it's, much less, it's much less oversight um, in, to this medication. And the third medication is naltrexone. It comes as a pill or a monthly intramuscular injection. Uh, it's an opioid antagonist, so we have the whole spectrum now from a full agonist to a partial agonist, and this is an antagonist, so it actually turns off the opioid receptor. And what that does is very similar to, in terms of uh, its effects, methadone and buprenorphine, that it's intended to blunt or block the intoxication effect of opioids and to decrease cravings. The indication for naltrexone and the use of opioid use disorder is to prevent relapse when used together with counseling. Another really interesting thing is that, you know, it's naltrexone is also approved for the use in alcohol use disorder. So it's something to really think about if somebody has severe opioid and co-occurring alcohol use disorder that you can kill two birds with one stone with this medication. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the trickiness occurs where, uh, because uh, the person needs to be opioid free for about seven to 10 days in order to start this medication. Otherwise, the antagonist effect will uh, occur on whatever opioids might still be in the person's body causing opioid withdrawal. And, you know, that's tough for some patients to be, to tell them that they need to be seven to 10 days off of uh, all opioids. And during that time, they're also at higher risk for a fatal overdose because their bodies will no longer be used to taking opioids. They'll have no tolerance to opioids. And so there could also be some risk associated. Um, for years before the uh, Vivitrol, the intramuscular injection was um, introduced, uh, there was a lot of issues of poor compliance. And uh, the, the reason why the intramuscular injection was, was introduced in part was to improve that as well. So somebody doesn't have to take, remember to take their medication every single day. They can just come in once per month for that. Um, it, it might be most useful for a highly motivated patients. So I, I think sometimes of um, using naltrexone for professionals who really like have a lot to lose if they don't follow through with a particular treatment plan. The issue is that, you know, if people um, walk off of treatment with methadone or buprenorphine, there will be some physical effects from that decision to do so in terms of withdrawal. Um, there would be no such effects with naltrexone since it doesn't activate the opioid receptor, and you know that's part of the issue of poor compliance. But somebody who's highly motivated uh, might be a really good candidate. So despite the fact that there are these medications that are available, these life-saving medications, there unfortunately still is this um, this treatment gap. So 
the uh, the availability of medications for addiction treatment uh, are uh, is um, exceeds the, uh, the the availability does not meet what the needs are for this, especially considering the increased um, uh, the the increased amount of use of opioids in a way that are is where it's not intended. So the uh, this slide here shows past year opioid use disorder um, on the top curve, and then the the curve right underneath that shows here. this curve here shows the total MAT capacity, and this is made up of an addition of this curve, which is buprenorphine, and this which is methadone. And so we have this treatment gap here. And in fact, this, uh, this study really utilized a rather liberal estimate for capacity, uh, assuming that each buprenorphine prescriber could, in theory, reach what the allowable cap is for buprenorphine use. So you know, why is buprenorphine underutilized? Uh, there, really, there are few wavered prescribers overall. And only 50% of those who do have the waiver prescribe buprenorphine at all. So they went through the process of getting their, their, um, their training. So it's an eight-hour training for uh, physicians. And for nurse practitioners or physician assistants, it's a 24-hour training. Following that, these uh, medical providers uh, applied through SAMHSA for their waiver and received their waiver. But still, only 50% have prescribed at all. And of those that are using them, they typically have few patients that are being that are that are being treated under their waiver. And the perceived barriers are multiple. Uh, we'll talk about a lot of these. Um, you know, there's one is the induction logistics. So there is a possibility of putting somebody in opioid withdrawal if, when buprenorphine is started, the person isn't in an um, in some withdrawal already, and that could be intimidating to a provider who really doesn't want to do any harm. Secondly, the worries about poor compliance, and some data shows that this is really, um, you know, is the case in a, lot of, uh, in a lot of cases where people start buprenorphine medication, maybe are on it for a month or two and then stop taking it, or poor compliance with recommendations for counseling. The counseling might also be limited uh, overall. So it might be difficult to find substance use disorder counselors in an area where a physician practices. And then finally, it's, it's thought to be difficult and time consuming to take care of this population. And you know, what I'd say is that it probably is in a lot of cases. And, but you know, once they get stabilized, then it's really not difficult and not so time consuming. But especially the part where they have to do an initial assessment um, and then determine what, if any, medication is available. That part can be um, challenging and time-consuming, especially if somebody hasn't been doing this before. So the issue that comes up a lot is, um, you know, it, are we treating people for substance use disorder in a system of care where there's many parts to it, um, different parts providing different types of treatment, but all connected together so that there's a operational and effective and efficient system of care, or is it a compilation of parts? And, you know, unfortunately, to a large extent, our system for substance use disorder is actually just a compilation of parts that aren't connecting with each other. And, you know, I think this is part of the reason, you know, why many are, are most wavered and as yet to be wavered prescribers um, aren't meeting what their potential is in terms of treatment because they feel isolated among other components of care for you know, the treatment of substance use disorders. A, um, you know, a, a compilation of services that's uh, fragmented, uh, that is made available to a population that is vulnerable is often not utilized and certainly not efficient. The vulnerabilities of our patients are multiple. They're often homeless, uh, they have a lack of supports, somatic and mental health problems, a lack of finances. These are all the ravages that opioid use disorder can cause patients. Um, you know, there's limited coping skills and organizational abilities often because they've been using drugs for so long they've never maybe even developed those sorts of skills. And then of course legal problems as well. For prescribers, 
um, or potent, potential prescribers, they, you know, they probably don't feel supported by these disconnected elements of care. And so there's, an, there's a sense of being fearful of diving into this sort of practice. And you know, I think that as much as physicians, uh, PAs and NPs can be educated about how to provide this treatment, um, at some point their fears of doing this on their own need to be allayed. And this is really where coordinated care can fit in very nicely. Specifically, opioid treatment programs are, um, are in a position where um, the, the qualities of opioid treatment programs can be leveraged to help with this. And what are those qualities? Well, there's the 50 years of expertise, of course. And um, in, in theory, any of the three medications can be used. There are some limitations to this that um, are hopefully being addressed over the past few years and in, in, the, in the next few months or years. Um, more and more o OTPs are using uh, buprenorphine and naltrexone in addition to methadone. But in order for that to happen, of course, there need to be reimbursement models that can, um, can help with that. Um, OTPs have integrated counseling and case management. So that, that can be leveraged to really to help to bring along um, community prescribers if a system of care is designed to be able to support that. OTPs have mandated medical services and staffing, such as physicians, um, PAs, nurse practitioners, and nurses. So, you know, there is that element of medical care already built into the system. And the accreditation through um, Joint Commission or CARF encourages quality and quality improvement and comprehensiveness of treatment. The frequent contacts with patients are also important. Um, early on, patients need to come in six or seven days per week. And although this can be burdensome to patients, what it really does is it, it, it does a number of things. One, it helps the patient feel more comfortable in the treatment program. It helps the treatment program get to know the patient more and, and also be able to monitor for changes over time. And, you know, in, in some ways, uh, the OTP becomes not even like a health home, but almost a, a, a home. Um, it's some place that people who might have been homeless or been going from one house to another, uh, they might now have this place for more years than they've had any place else uh, over the past 10 years that they can call home where they feel comfortable and where there are people where they know are supportive and have their best interest. So OTPs can help to encourage and support physician practices by addressing these, the concerns that they have. And I, I like to recognize them as these, these three I's. That's um, the initial assessment, the induction period and instability. So in terms of instability, it's you know what what happens when people are getting prescribed buprenorphine through an office-based practice if well maybe they don't even get stabilized in the first place early in treatment or they stabilize and then they relapse. What happens if they divert medication? They're running out of medications early, um, or if they're non-adherent, they come in a week or two weeks late for their next appointment and their next prescription, and then. What are the consequences to, to the patients, but as well as to the general practice by having people who, are, who have unstable substance use disorder in that practice and in the waiting room? So you know, a way to address those three eyes of concern is through another eye, which is integration. Um, and yes, there is an eye in integration, unlike an eye in teamwork, but this is a little bit different actually. In integration, you know, we are each as individuals responsible for maintaining communication with other providers of treatment and support. So, you know, the, and this will go back to that time and time again, that communication is really key. So how is clinical integration defined? Now, this is probably the favorite definition that I've found so far. Um, and I'll read this. It says, it's the extent to which patient care services are coordinated across people, functions, activities, and sites over time so as to maximize the value of services delivered to patients. Value is important. Value to patients is important because it keeps them coming. Value to payers is important because it keeps them paying. Value to society is important because it keeps the funding coming through 
SAMHSA and, and other federal and state entities. So this two by two chart um, shows that there could be um, for a healthcare delivery um, entities. It could be a single location or multiple locations. Those are the columns. And then there could be a single provider entity or multiple provider entities. So for example, my program, we have a single location and we do have a multidisciplinary team. So we have nurses and social workers and counselors and peer recovery specialists and administrative people, um, but they're all part of our entity. And so this is called a multi-specialty team. On the other hand, there could be um, a, let's say we decided to bring in a, uh, a primary care practice to operate in a new wing in our building to do primary care. So that would be multiple provider entities, the primary care practice and our opioid treatment program, um, but in a single location. So that is called co-location or shared space. What we'll be talking about for the rest of our time here today is this, there's multiple locations and multiple provider entities. So that's collaboration or coordination. The way that AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, defines care coordination is deliberately organizing patient care activities and sharing information among all the participants concerned with the patient's care to achieve safer and more effective care. The patient's needs and preferences are known ahead of time and communicated at the right time to the right people. Information is used to provide safe, appropriate, and effective care to patients. And if you look at this, I see a lot of communication words here. Sharing, um, communicating, um, and um, information. So, and that's really the, the commonality in all of these goals of, of care coordination. So this is the part of the talk where I'll be talking about just one illustrative example of how a model of care coordination can be conceived and implemented. And you know, I, I think this is important because you know, it's all well and good if I tell my staff, listen, I want you all to coordinate care. Um, but there's so many ways to coordinate and, um, and it does take extra time and it could be done in, in, in various manners, in various time points. And so really creating a model is very helpful. And with this particular model, the aim is to increase both the access to and effectiveness of medications for addiction treatment, and specifically for opioid use disorder, through concurrent opioid treatment program-based counseling, case management, a collaborative step care model and expert consultation. Um, and this actually started um, not as, you know, I want to, today I want to create a model of care. That's just not how it started. It actually started the first week that I came into treatment where I was presented a treatment, uh, a, a discharge plan, and the physician is supposed to sign off on these. And um, as I'm signing it, I'm asking, okay, well, why is this person discharged? I was new, I really didn't know this person yet. And they said, well, because she got a, a buprenorphine provider, prescriber. She was getting buprenorphine in our program, and then she got a buprenorphine prescriber. And so I said, okay, but why is she being discharged? Did, did she meet all of her treatment goals on her treatment plans? And, and of course, the answer was no. And so at that point, I um, changed what the rules had been in our program. And I said, well, anybody that gets a buprenorphine prescriber um, as long as we think that it was a reasonable thing to do, and ideally we'll be helping them with that process of finding one, and as long as the prescriber is willing to coordinate care with us, and as long as the patient's willing to allow us to do so by signing a release of information sheet, then um, let's not discharge them. Let's keep on providing them with the verbal therapies that we believe is helping them with their overall functionality, with accomplishing their goals, with maybe they have co-occurring um, other substance use disorders. So. Because this particular model was able to be, uh, you know, implemented without a complex and you know multiple entity stakeholder planning process, it's a bit more plug and play, if you will, than than some other models that are out there. And this this shows it a bit more graphically. We have our OTP hub, 
And you know, the typical services that are, that are provided in the hub include the comprehensive uh, substance use disorder evaluation. Uh, in this case, we're talking about buprenorphine primarily, induction and maintenance, um, or methadone maintenance, uh, or naltrexone, and then counseling services, group and individual counseling. And then various OTPs have various other wraparound services, and probably none have all of these that are listed, um, but might have various wraparound services that really match the patient population as well as what the resources are in the community where they're operating. And then there's spokes. The spokes are the office-based buprenorphine or OBB uh, prescribers. And that is where buprenorphine is being, prescriptions are being written and then filled in community pharmacies. The, um, it, you know, in my outreach, the potential prescriber practice spokes, I you know, stressed that my OTP would do the heavy lifting of treatment, uh, at, that when it comes to, you know, treating this really potentially intimidating disorder, that, that we would make sure that what they're doing is primarily writing prescriptions for stable patients. I told them we would do the initial assessment, for example, and we would do the induction and stabilize them initially. Um, we would stabilize them in terms of other drugs as well uh, by delivery of, of verbal therapies and behavioral contingencies um, and, and provide other services while also on an ongoing basis monitoring their progress um, and, and working with them, communicating with, with them, and when necessary, taking back their medication dispensing during times that they're particularly unstable. The, the way this is done, the way that the treatment decisions are done is through an adaptive step care model. And what I did here was to take a, a model that I learned under uh, Dr. Robert Bruner's um, clinic at another Johns Hopkins program. Uh, that, that he's, he's uh, created that and published on that extensively on that, uh, on that model. Um, and then expanded the scope of that adaptive step care model. And what adaptive step care model in this particular one does is that it uses objective uh, measures to determine treatment plan changes. And specifically here, the objective measures are percent adherence to counseling treatment and toxicology screens. And you know, it turns out that adherence to treatment is highly correlated with drug use. And you know, just completely coincidentally, I had a counselor come up to me this morning with a urine toxicology results for somebody who had been highly stable uh, for quite some time and said cocaine positive. And you know, I had told her to, to get a urine toxicology, make sure it was observed, and um, because I suspect that the person might have relapsed. And she asked me, how did you know? And, and I knew because I was looking at the attendance for our Saturday groups, and you know, he works during the week, he prefers to go to groups on Saturdays, and he missed Saturday. He missed that group. And I just know that, that adherence, uh, poor adherence and drug use go hand in hand. If they haven't relapsed yet, they're probably about to if they stop going to their sessions. So we use these two uh, measures to determine the intensity of counseling sessions that are scheduled, the duration of prescriptions that are written in our spokes, so one week versus four weeks typically, and then to determine if there needs to be periods where the OTP takes back the dispensing of the buprenorphine medication. Overall, what we do is if somebody has a poor or partial response, meaning they're, they're using drugs, let's say, we change the plan. We don't discharge them. We don't discharge people for having symptoms of a medical disorder, right? We change the treatment plan. And, and we also, in, in the treatment of regular medical disorders we use, or psychiatric disorders, we don't usually throw our hands up and proclaim this person's treatment resistant or they're not ready yet, so there's nothing we can do. We have to wait till they hit rock bottom. Well, you know, rock bottom nowadays with fentanyl and car fentanyl out there is typically death. So we change the treatment plan. And we use behavioral contingencies to improve engagement. My main outcome measure, if I had to think of one, it would be adherence to treatment, above, even above uh, urine results or lack of drug use, because I know that if people continue to be engaged in treatment, that they're going to learn what they need to do in order to uh, be able to achieve and then maintain 
uh, drug-free status. Ultimately, drug, I mean, engagement is required. Um, if somebody just tells me, Dr. Stoller, I, I think, you know, I like this medication you're giving me, but I, I hate counseling. I'm not going to come to counseling. I know I'm still using cocaine, but I'm not going to come to counseling. I'm not going to do what you say. They can't sort of like, you know, pick the M&Ms out of the trail mix, right? They need to come to everything, but we'll work together. We'll use uh, motivational interviewing. We'll, we'll use positive behavioral contingencies. Um, to try to make sure that people are, are have the uh, uh, optimal optimal um, chances of eventually engaging very well in treatment, and it, and it works well. This has been studied. So this is um, a a graphic of our level system. You can see the rows here. the uh, The top of the four rows is for the most stable patients. And as people destabilize, they move down to um, in steps, so downwards in the rows. And as they stabilize, they move back up. So our step one is for stable office-based buprenorphine patients. So they're getting buprenorphine through office prescriptions about one month at a time, and the counseling intensity is rather low. It could be as low as one individual session or one group session per month. If people destabilize, and again, we use we use our adherence to treatment and we use urine toxicology results. For the person that I had mentioned that missed his Saturday uh, meeting, we would have intensified his, his treatment a bit more, probably not to intensive um, outpatient and IOP, but we would have at least started seeing him um, more regularly individually and collecting weekly urines. So as people, um, are continuing to demonstrate a lack of stability. These gray boxes here show how we can intensify treatment. So in step two, person is getting a week's prescriptions through their um, prescriber and are in more intensive counseling. If somebody continues then to, to, to be unstable, then we can take that, their buprenorphine. They're still getting buprenorphine, but now they're getting it through the OTP dispensary. So they have to come every day to get medication. So again, what that does is it allows us to see the person more regularly, this person who's not very stable. It allows us to deliver positive messages like, oh, you're looking a lot better since you came in here and you started going to your groups. And I, I saw your last week's urine was negative. Congratulations. And that's really, really powerful for this population. Um, and it, it also acts as a, a negative reinforcer. So people would like to eventually get back to getting their monthly prescriptions. And so they know, all right, in order to do this, I need to just come to all my sessions for sometimes for some people it's two weeks, for sometimes it's four weeks, depending on how long they've been there. Come to all my sessions and leave drug negative urines during those weeks, and I can get back to my prescriber and not have to go to all these groups. And and that works. Finally, if people just continue to struggle, they say, look, I'm still having a lot of cravings, they're still using um, you know, opioids despite a good dose of buprenorphine. We talk to them about methadone. Sometimes people just need methadone. They need that full agonist as opposed to the partial agonist. Or some other treatment plan. Maybe uh, somebody needs to go inpatient for a while just to let their brain sort of unpickle from chronic use of some other sorts of drugs, um, benzodiazepines, cocaine, and so forth. Uh, but whatever we do, we really try to, um, to change the treatment plan and see how that works as opposed to looking at discharge. The, I, I tell my staff we will never discharge somebody for drug use, but we can discharge somebody for refusal to, uh, to engage in treatment. So if somebody continues to use, we're just going to keep on changing their treatment plan until we find something that works. So this is a very brief case example of somebody that went through this model. Um, what I'd like you to focus primarily on are these pink or purple uh, elements here. So on the top, what we have here is a timeline. So this arrow here is going to march toward the right as time marches on. And then we have this rectangle that's going to bounce up and down depending on what step this person is in. So this was a 54-year-old uh, woman that was admitted to our treatment program for opioid and cocaine use. She also happened to have hypertension, COPD, sarcoid, DJD, degenerative joint disease uh, with disc herniations. And we determined after a, a complete evaluation 
that buprenorphine was appropriate for her and that's what she wanted. We inducted her onto the medication. And uh, at the time, we thought that IOP treatment most matched her needs. I believe she actually came out of the acute hospital at a level four uh, detox. So we, um, she actually had a primary care provider that was a buprenorphine prescriber already. So that was very uh, convenient. And so we started coordinating care with the primary care provider. And actually within two weeks, the primary care provider took over prescribing the buprenorphine. So we stopped dispensing it in our program. PCP now is writing prescriptions and a patient is getting groups in our program. We stepped her um, down further to our low level of care as you know, later that month she continued to be stable, continued to get prescriptions from her primary care provider at that point monthly. Um, six months later, she came up cocaine positive in our program. And um, she, she told us, my, my housemate put it in my ice tray. Um, and um, so we started, and then she also started missing OTP counseling, which also speaks to that um, co-occurrence of missing counseling and coming up positive. So we moved her to intensive outpatient treatment. So that's about nine or 10 hours of groups per week. So she did stabilize after about a month. She had negative toxicology results. She had good attendance. So we reduced her counseling and um, she continued to get prescriptions from her primary care provider. Two months later, she had another tox screen that was positive. Um, she said that, oh, well, people near me at a party were smoking cocaine. And when we pointed out that her urine was also positive for, her, for opioids, she said, oh yeah, and a man spilled heroin on me in a cab. It was a bad day. So we um, increased her to IOP counseling once again. This time she didn't stabilize quite as quickly. A month later, she um, came up positive again for opioids. She said she took an opioid for, for neck pain. Um, she failed a medication callback. So we asked her, we said, okay, well, just bring in your buprenorphine just to show us that you're taking it responsibly. Um, she came in the next day without her buprenorphine said, oh yeah, on the way I fell and crushed all my tablets. So at that point, we changed her to OTP observed dispensing and called the physician to let them know we were doing this. Her toxicology screen within a month, she was transferred back to office-based buprenorphine prescribing and remained successful. So you can see where you know, the, there's benefits to having this sort of integrative model um, on a number of levels um, on, for patients, for opioid treatment programs, for office-based prescriber practices, and for health systems or payers. So in terms of patients, you know, patients will have easier access once to treatment, to MAT, once there are more prescribers out there. And this is a way to get more prescribers. Also, there's a wider spectrum of services and intensities of treatment. So somebody can go from very low level of care to an intensive level of care and, and not have to change their overall providers, not have to seek treatment someplace else and completely start over. And that's really good for patients. More of their needs are met um, with this sort of model. And there's better communication between care providers. And really it's when there's poor communication with care providers that, that harm can happen. And, and often our patients try to sort of sow the seeds of miscommunication between care providers as well. So this also prevents that sort of splitting effects. Um, quality of care is enhanced. So the, the prescribers that are, you know, are connected with our OTP, I'd like to think, are providing a higher level quality of care for patients because the patients get a more uh, robust spectrum of services available to them. And it's also more safe because there's more communication between providers. But importantly, um, you know, this actually has the potential for improved outcome. So for, for patients. So rather than going to a physician who is providing, you know, just medication prescriptions for 275 patients and really not getting much else, they can actually get more improved outcome by being part of this larger system. In terms of the benefits to OTPs like my own, as I said, we have a wider spectrum of services now that we can provide. 
And, you know, for every patient that we're not dispensing because they're getting their buprenorphine through prescribing, we can now admit more people to our program and increase our capacity, increase our, our census in our program. And um, the, uh, this can generate volumes and um, you know, more volumes or more, more revenue in terms of services. Um, in, in fact, um, the, I didn't package this model. I mean, we started doing this model, but I didn't really package it until we had an issue where we needed more volume. We had um, lost some grant funding um, in the state because the state was moving more from grant funding to, um, to fee-for-service. And I had some people that were grant funded in my program, and I asked my departmental administration, can I keep those employees? They're, these are good employees. We have a lot of need in our community. Uh, and I, I promised to get more patients. And so I was responsible for reporting back to the department uh, every week with two programs or entities outside of my program um, where, that I would visit and try to get more referrals. And so this is what I did. And this is what got me going to these primary care and mental health sites to try to create more of this uh, hub and spoke system. There's, I also, it's nice also I have free mentorship for co-occurring conditions. So if I have a patient with, you know, sarcoid and gets submitted to my program, even if they're on methadone or not, you know, not on this, uh, in this model, or maybe they have alcohol only. But now I have relationships with primary care providers in the community. I can just pick up the phone and give a call and get some free mentorships. And that's, that's been really nice. Um, and then importantly, and I think even like most Im importantly, my patients now have improved medical and mental health adherence and, and reduced morbidity. So if they're getting their care through their primary care provider, so the person, that their prescriptions, that is. So the person that's prescribing the buprenorphine are the people that are taking care of their physical health problems. Those patients are driven to receive, to, to attend their primary care visits. And the fact is, like, my patients, because of the, the effect of our program, like, we're very effective in terms of reducing people's drug use. Uh, especially opioid use, these medications are very effective. So they're dying from things like heart disease or cancer. They're not dying from overdoses. Um, and this is this is just like you know patients with severe mental illness as well. They're they're dying 20 years before age matched comparisons. So an increase in adherence to treatment, and whether it's to their psychiatric treatment provider. Um, if they're getting their buprenorphine through their psychiatrist or through their primary care provider, it enhances the person's quality of life, longevity, productivity, you know, all things that are the primary aim of any sort of treatment. And, you know, this is why we don't just simply have a few offices where we bring in office-based prescribers and doing it out of our program. I really like this, this, these connections to community-based primary care. Then finally, and it benefits to office-based Providers. So now, previously untreated addiction is finally being addressed. Medical problems are more likely to be addressed, therefore, because people who have ongoing active addiction are not taking care of themselves. They're not going to their appointments. They're not taking their medications. Um, conversely, to what I said about having free advice from primary care, I'm able to provide support and ready access to uh, for behavioral health issues and especially um, for addiction issues to to these. Uh, partners as well, and we can you know we can partner together to manage behaviorally challenging cases, and that's really what people need. If there's challenging cases, well, what do I want? I want some partners. I want people to be able to like run ideas by and try to you know figure things out as a team. And it can also enhance outcome and scores and quality indicators. And I'm going to show you some examples of this, and this is becoming increasingly important in an age of value-based purchasing. So this is a um, study that was done looking at a FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center. For those of you who might not be familiar with it, it's, it's basically a community-based um, comprehensive primary care site. They provide all sorts of treatment um, to, to people regardless of their ability to pay. So they're really they're part of sort of the, what's called the safety net. And this is from Marwan and colleagues out of Connecticut. 
So it was an observational cohort study uh, of a FQHC network in Connecticut. There were 266 buprenorphine initiates um, between 2007 and 2008. And what it showed that the people that started buprenorphine treatment were, um, had improved engagement in primary care. They raised their scores of quality healthcare indicators. For those who were HIV positive, they were more likely to achieve viral suppression. And each month that they were on buprenorphine was associated with a 17% reduction in ER use. And which that, that last bullet there is a nice segue to benefits to society or the payer. Um, and this is, this shows the, you know, off cited, um, Cal data study that showed that, um, that for every dollar that's spent on substance use disorder treatment, that $5 comes back to society. So this doesn't, just look at uh, health-related savings, but also looks at savings related to criminal justice uh, expenses or um, lost wages uh, and, and so forth. This study looked at um, Mass Massachusetts health claims data from 2003 to 2007 and basically shows that when treating people with um, MAT and specifically buprenorphine and methadone, as compared to drug-free treatment, that MAT is associated with decreased ex Medicaid expenditures, with fewer relapses, and with decreased mortality. So and it's important that all of these elements, the, the patient, the um, OTP, the spokes providing the prescribing and payers are, are all incentivized because once everybody, all these incentives are aligned, that's when these sorts of, um, of models can get traction, can be uh, created, and can be continued over time. Everybody needs to buy in. So our early experience in Baltimore has been that we've been able to form these successful partnerships. We've increased access to MAT. Um, in, in fact, at one of the Hopkins-based primary care sites that we work a lot with, the, uh, the, the urban health residency decided that uh, preceptors had to get their buprenorphine waivers in order to be able to precept, which was amazing. And before that happened, I would have urban health residents and fellows call me to say, you know, it's just so frustrating. They want some experience in using buprenorphine. They want to be able to do this when they go out and practice, but they can't get any practice. With doing this, there's been a very positive response from trainees, which is so important because it's, it's early positive responses to, uh, to people providing these services that will predict their ongoing use in the future. We've been able to enhance coordination of uh, substance use disorder, medical, and psychiatric care, and we've been able to effectively and rapidly manage relapse. So how do we do that? We um, incentivize all parties, as I've said. We've involved leadership early, so I, as the leader of my program, has been, of course, involved early, and then I would specifically engage with the medical director or practice director of, of these various primary care and psychiatric practices. Keeping communication open is key. Right, and um, admittedly at times, uh, we might drop the ball, and we have to get back on track. Um, it's really important to keep that communication going. Um, for example, if somebody drops out of treatment in our program, we really need to be able to get on the phone and tell the prescriber that this person's out of treatment here, they might come back to get another prescription from you and don't believe them when they tell you that they're still coming to their sessions. And we think that you probably shouldn't write any more prescriptions and send them back to us. It's been important to assign a single point of contact. So, uh, you know, each of the larger sites, we try to get one person that if we want to refer a patient to that practice site, we can call that one person and they can get that ball rolling. Um, progressive reimbursement systems are important. So, for example, Maryland was a very early adapter of the um, buprenorphine, having a buprenorphine rate specifically for dispensing in opioid treatment programs, and that was very important. And then dispelling myths. So, you know, because we're now treating people 
on you know, any of the three medications for opioid use disorder, maybe no medications here where we are and they're getting it someplace else, they're not, they might not be on it at all, or maybe they don't even have opioid use disorder. Maybe it's some other drug use disorder. Uh, we have all our patients in the same groups take, being taken care of by the same counselors and using the same waiting rooms, the same cafeteria when they're eating. There's no problems with that. We don't have any finger pointing about, you know, you're clean and you're not and all that nonsense. Everybody gets along perfectly fine. We just treat these medications as tools to help people in their recovery. So overall, in terms of care coordination, these are just some things that I would say um, it can be learned that I've learned from using the co-op model that can be maybe generalized to other care coordination efforts, like what's the secret sauce? So here's some ingredients. One is the clinical staff communicating well, so both internally with each other, and so we have a multidisciplinary team round every day where we discuss patients, and then of course with these external entities that we're coordinating with. Um, this is something that I don't have yet, but I would like to work on over time. Having some in, um, information technology system or solution that will help in the tracking of this ongoing response and to provide some decision support functionality. So there's a, my, my counselors are um, doing a lot of tracking of you know, how somebody's doing, what their percent attendance is, what were their last few urine results, how far are they in treatment, how many take homes do they have, and then there's a lot of decisions that need to be made on that. And so it's a lot to keep in their mind. And so I think that, you know, and it, to me, it's an IT system would be very useful. Um, there needs to be reimbursement systems that will um, encourage care management activities and also encourage peer recovery support. Um, I didn't mention this, but we have an amazing peer recovery um, specialist who provides services such as helping people find housing, helping get their ID, all those sorts of things bring value to treatment. And the more value that patients place on treatment, the more likely it is that they'll adhere to that treatment and keep coming. And, and that's when outcomes improve. Working with state and local systems um, to link elements is important. And also to get SUD education in the professional schools so that the people that we're trying to link with actually know something about substance use disorder. So we've talked about one, two, and three. The so one is linking with current buprenorphine prescribers, two is linking with primary care, three is linking with mental health. I think that linking with other providers, you know, in terms of expanding this sort of model, it could be really useful. So linking with, uh, with pain treatment providers, there's so much co-occurrence of chronic pain problems and addiction problems. Linking with the obstetric providers so that we can better manage pregnant women who have substance use disorders, and infectious disease treatment providers. So our hospital up the street has a a clinic called the Bartlett Clinic. It's, um, it provides treatment for people with HIV and hepatitis, and we uh, coordinate very closely with them. And in fact, for some time, they were coming to our program to, to help to educate patients and to actually start seeing patients who have hepatitis C to try to get those patients cured. I think that collaborating with payers is, is important to try to uh, demonstrate the value of these coordination activities and, frankly, to demonstrate the value of our program. Um, health homes and OTPs can be very uh, useful as well. It's a way to provide the structure and reimbursement for this type of coordination um, and embedded care. Um, it's actually part of the Vermont Hub and Spoke model, um, which is a, a similar sort of uh, model that was designed by Tony Folland and John Brooklyn and, and colleagues in Vermont. All of the OTPs in that model are also health homes. Um, coordination with hospitals is very natural, um, especially when people go inpatient. It's important to extend that coordination to those units where they're located. Working with government, policymakers, regulatory bodies, um, SAMHSA is, is amazing to work with and is so future oriented. And I'm just you know, so happy that this specific series is being offered as well. Functional uh, linkage between SUD providers, and this is a, sort of ironically, this is one of the areas that where there's the fewest linkages, so between addiction providers. If 
if one of my patients leaves treatment, says they're going to go to some other program down the road, I'm going to call that program and tell them about this patient. You know, why let them simply start over just to determine that, yes, this person has ongoing cocaine use and really should be going to intensive outpatient groups. Um, additionally, and sim similarly, um, in terms of support services, uh, you know, the, those support services might not be friendly to MAT. And I think the way to get people to understand MAT and the utility of it is to, uh, and for example, in housing, is to, to engage, and we need to do that. And then finally, telemedicine and mobile technology. Um, you know, telemedicine might be a way to extend the reach of this model, effectively turning what might be like a tricycle wheel into a 10-speed wheel for those biking fans out there. So, you know, so spokes can be further from the hub, but connected through virtual means. Barriers include always include stigma, um, it, not only in terms of, of um, providers, but also stigma keeps patients from entering treatment. We need to convince OTP leadership to do this. We need to convince spoke leaders to do this. And we need to solidify funding. Um, MAT should be in all forms of MAT. It should be covered um, in all settings um, and by all payers. So Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance. And reimbursement should be uh, created for innovative models, including time spent in doing these sorts of coordination activities. I want to end with um, these last two slides. Um, this, uh, th these are white papers that were created through ATOD that were commissioned by SAMHSA really on this topic. The first one, it's a series of three, but the first two really focus on this area of coordination. The first one is entitled Models of Integrated Patient Care Through OTPs and Data 2000 Practices. And the other is um, Integrated Service Delivery Models for Opioid Treatment Programs in the Era of Increasing Opioid Addiction, Health Reform, and Parity. And uh, so this slide has some other links that are very useful um, in, in this sort of endeavor. And I just want to thank everybody for um, calling in and for attending to this meeting. And I want to thank SAMHSA for creating this very important series. Great, Dr. Sellers. Thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. We had some comments uh, talking about what a nice job you had done here with this information. So, <clears throat> excuse me again, thank you very much for your time today. We do have a few minutes left for questions. And we do have several questions that uh, folks have, have input into the chat box. So I'm going to start with the first one here. And this is, tends to be a very common question from behavioral health providers. Uh, related to funding. You did touch a little bit on this uh, in your presentation, but perhaps you could expand. Our funder for the addictions program in Philadelphia does not currently pay for care coordination services. What do you believe is needed to help funders see the value of funding this service at addiction clinics? Well, the answer is always data, right? So um, you know, the more data we can show to, to show the value of MAT, um, specifically, uh, but that also the interplay between MAT and um, and somatic healthcare and mental healthcare, and uh, especially the connection between adherence to treatment and things that cost actual money. So, with looking at the um, being able to uh, prevent costly ER visits or inpatient visits, the um, the argument then needs to be made to the, to connect those dots that there's something that can be done in the OTP to help, and specifically to help to reduce those costs. And you know, I, I think that we need to start implementing these sorts of models, collecting data on it, and uh, getting the word out there. I think, you know, I think really sitting down with, um, with those health officials and um, you know, having them visit our programs, showing them what we're doing, uh, and, and again, you know, showing some data is really important. We, one thing that we've done in our programs, just as an example, is we brought over um, for our, the, the MCO that has the most patients in our program, we brought over a care manager from that MCO. So that, it, um, that MCO was very sort of forward thinking, was willing to, like, to do this. So for a half a day per week, this care manager would come over. They'd talk to our patients about their health care. They'd look to see if they have any uh, a primary care that's assigned, if they're going to that primary care provider. And then would also bring um, 
what they called opportunity reports. So looking at things that they're judged on as a health plan. So what's called the HEDIS measures. And for the patients that, um, that were, were sort of behind on those services, whether it's getting a mammogram or a pap smear or a diabetic eye exam or whatever it might be, they then work with those patients in our program at helping them to schedule it, helping to, um, to provide transportation. Often there, there's some um, incentives like gift cards and getting them to come. And what it, and I collected a little bit of data on that and it showed that 25% of our patients were, um, were non-compliant with their, the timing of their mammogram and their uh, cervical cancer screenings. And if you look at what that rate should be, if you just look at you know, inner city women, regardless of their having an addiction problem, the, um, the compliance rate should be 25%. So it showed a, a, a threefold increase in compliance. And it's those sorts of, of data elements that we can, you know, we can show to payers and we can show to policymakers that will help to convince them that this is a, a worthwhile effort. Wonderful, thank you very much. What suggestions do you have for areas that don't have comprehensive programs and insurance companies that won't pay for these services? Well, so for areas that don't have, let's say, opioid treatment programs, um, you know, I did mention telehealth, and that's something that we should look toward in the future, and there's some experimenting with that. But the other thing is that, you know, there there are other sorts of specialty substance use disorder treatment programs that aren't necessarily opioid treatment programs. And so, you know, they still might have a lot of those elements uh, that can be added in terms of um, counseling services. Uh, they might be able to do, you know, daily observed treatment, even or medication treatment. They could do frequent pill counts. Um, they could do case management referral to recovery supports. And so, you know, connect, connecting those programs as hubs to provider spokes could be another way to, to go. What you don't have there is the ability to switch to methadone. Um, you know, that is something that I think we as, um, as a, a treatment system should be looking at not only increasing buprenorphine prescribers, but also increasing opioid treatment programs so that everybody has access to all of those, uh, those treatments. Fortunately, um, there's been a lot of movement um, over the past few years and making these medications and treatments um, available in terms of reimbursement. There's a number of states that had for years not um, been reimbursing OTP services through Medicaid that have now put in and have gotten approved um, new Medicaid uh, waivers that allow that reimbursement. And there's, in, in fact, in, federally, there's some legislation now that will, for the first time, bring o, OTP services or make OTP services reimbursable under a Medicare benefit. And so, you know, hopefully these, these sorts of developments will, will pass and will continue to, to improve. Great. Thank you. Uh, in a similar vein, uh, and I think you talked a little bit about uh, some of the non-compliance issues uh, with treatment plans, how do you work with patients that live further away from the hub that are then needing to return from the spoke uh, due to non-compliance with the treatment plan? Yeah, I, I think the, er the answer is very similar. And, um, you know, the, the thing about these, these models and is the reason why I said this is just one example is the, these models need to be adjusted based on what resources are available and what patient population is being served. So in, in that case, you know, again, we can utilize some elements of telehealth if that's available. If it's not available, then, um, then leveraging other um, counseling services in the area can be important as well. Um, you know, one resource that is, I think, often underused is uh, family and other support people. And, you know, that's actually another way that we um, extend our reach from our program out to our patients to the extent that they do have some supportive people in the community. So let's say we, let's say we start somebody on an abuse for, um, or disulfiram for opioid use disorder, for alcohol use disorder, 
one thing I would tell my patient is, is that, um, you know, if I think that they're not taking it, is, well, how about if we engage your wife? Because I know she's very interested in you not drinking anymore, and we want to avoid her falsely accusing you of drinking. So I think that if, if she watches you take this medication every day, and she's going to know that if you're drinking, that you'd be getting sick. So let's engage her in this sort of way. Um, you know, one of our programs uh, at Hopkins uh, has a what's called a, a community support person intervention, where there's a group once a week that has dyads of a patient and a person from the community that they know that come in and uh, just basically talk about an activity that they did, a pro-social activity. Um, outside of the program with the purpose of trying to increase their social support network and then going around and saying, well, what things might we do this next week? So I think making those connections, not only to other providers of care, but also to, uh, to family is important. Um, using peer recovery support specialists is another way to, uh, to, to increase those connections. And, and through those peer recovery support specialists or um, just program staff to connect people with other resources that might be available in that area. So if I was in an area that didn't have uh, an opioid treatment program, maybe it's very widespread, and there's a lot of areas out west that you know, it's just so much land out there, I would want to find out what resources are available and try to you know, see what they offer and to try to leverage those services as well. So it really sounds like a lot of out-of-the-box creative thinking and addressing the needs of the individual client where they're at and, and where they're best uh, fit into the system is what it sounds like you're saying. Yes, absolutely. And what it's, it's about what you have available as a program. Not every program can do everything. Um, what's available in the community and what's the typical um, patient that you're seeing, what, what are their needs? and then to try to devise something that addresses that. There's no, there really should be no one size fits all approach. It really should be tailored to those things, the factors of the patient, factors of the area, locality, and what the needs are. Great, thank you. Uh, one final question, and this may be uh, a fairly simple question as we come to the end of our session here. What is the typical counselor patient ratio at your OTP? Um, well, it's sort of a complicated answer in terms of my OTP because we are a hospital-based program, and in Maryland, we have a very specific and very complex way of, uh, of funding. So ours is ours is sort of on the low side, and we also um, we have intensive outpatient treatment, and we have people who are not on medication at all. So what I would say is the um, our goal is if we convert every, and there's a way I convert people to an equivalent amount of IOP patients, that it's about 12 IOP patients per counselor. Now, that said, it ends up that people, it's it's typically maybe in the high 20s in terms of total counts, total patients, but again, some of those are in different levels of care that require different levels of treatment for patients. And, um, but it just it could be very variable depending on state limits. Um, some states offer you know, monthly take-homes to, to patients, and so they don't require as many services. Um, you know, one of the reasons why I try to keep our census lower is because we get most of our patients through the acute care, through the acute units in the hospital, so a lot of them coming straight out of the psychiatric unit for you know, suicidality or straight off of the um, the medical units for some you know, medical you know, three or four chronic medical problems, and so those patients take a lot of um, they require a lot of attention, and because we're a hospital based program, we can we get higher reimbursement, so we can keep our caseloads lower. I think it just speaks again for um, really tailoring what you're doing to who you're serving. Great, Dr. Stiller, thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have right now for questions. Uh, we had a lot of questions related to uh, sort of hypothetical situations. How do you do this? How do you do that? Um, we also had several questions related to HIT uh, and communication and technology. And I would encourage everyone who's on the line now uh, to keep an eye out for the schedule of the rest of our webinar series 
because I can guarantee you we will be covering a lot of this information in subsequent webinars. So we have four more in this series. Uh, we will be, again, addressing case studies uh, from the field in our next webinar on May 10th. And then following that, we're really going to begin looking at bringing people to the table uh, to talk about strategies for implementation and operationalization of a lot of these concepts that Dr. Stoller has talked about today. Um, we have had several questions related to uh, how quickly can we get these slides. And Unfortunately, at this time, we are not going to be able to send these slides out any sooner than uh, posting them to the YouTube site. So please keep an eye out for more information about that link and where you can go to access copies of this webinar. Again, I want to thank everybody for taking their time out today uh, and listening to Dr. Stoller. Dr. Stoller, thank you again very much for your time. This was wonderful information and I think incredibly applicable to where we are right now in the field um, and going forward. So again, thank you to everyone. Thank you to SAMHSA, uh, our sponsors, for supporting us in this event. And we will see you on our next webinar, May 10th. Thank you.